to what extent do appropriated texts enrich our understanding of classic literature by providing a new voice for a new audience? Over the next 10 or so minutes, we'll find out. For last year's words belong to last year's language, and next year's words await another voice. This is a quote from poet T.S. Eliot's Little Gideon. The poem speaks of the violence of the Second World War as a consequence of both individuals and collectives turning away from what is right to achieve what is material. The language of the blind pursuit of earthly possession at the expense of what is holy is also spoken by Mary Shelley and a book Frankenstein. These old words have been adapted by the new voice of Mel Brooks in his comedic masterpiece, Young Frankenstein. The comparison of these two texts is going to assist us in answering the question, as demonstrated by how the authors discuss the frontier and how they discuss the collective. The words of Mary Shelley tell of the importance of a responsible creator, of a man who is so enchanted by the pursuit of knowledge that he ruins the lives all around him and creates a monster who is spurned and hated by a cruel world. Brooks adapted these words and recited them using his own voice. He tells of the importance of a responsible father, of a man who is so enchanted by the pursuit of knowledge that he enriches the lives all around him and creates a monster who is spurned but then loved by an understanding world. Clearly, this new voice has its own way of telling the story of a new voice brought on different values from a new world. A new world which has its own ideas about knowledge, creators, and creation. Both Shelley and Brooks use the theme of the frontier and the responsibility of the collective to demonstrate their close but distinct beliefs about the importance of the creator's responsibility. Shelley talks about the inhumanity of the frontier through a romanticist lens and how its blind pursuit is irresponsible as it causes both the creature and the society great suffering. Brooks discusses the triumph of the frontier through an American lens and how the taming of nature and acquisition of knowledge is a positive for both the creature and for society. Shelley's words speak of a frontier which violates the tenets of a romanticist lens. The four main tenets that Frankenstein defiles are the perfection of nature, the love of youthful innocence, the importance of emotion, and the glorification of the many evil. As seen in the creation of the monster, the abandonment of the monster, the frontier ending Victor's relationship with his wife, and the killing of Henry. Shelley demonstrates the frontier's violation of these four tenets to be a great tragedy and an insurmountable loss. The frontier that Fletcher pursues also violates these four tenets, as seen in the creation of the monster, the abandonment of the monster, the frontier ending Frederick's relationship with his fiancée, and the mockery of the gothic genre by Brooks. The important change in Brooks's voice is that he shows all of this suffering to be a necessary sacrifice which turns the wheels of progress, a sentiment which perfectly matches the ideals of the American frontier. The similarity in subject matter, but difference in values, is exhibited in the quote from Frankenstein in which Victor tells Walton about the creation of the monster. It was the most beautiful season, but my eyes were insensible to the charms of nature. The ignoring of nature to romantics like Shelley is almost a crime, and it seems to be harmful. By doing this, Shelley shows her views about the negative aspects of the frontier. In Brooks's adaptation, the grand semi crazed speech Frederick delivers before animating monster demonstrates the same sentiment. Tonight, we shall ascend into the heavens, we shall mock the earthquake, we shall command the thunders and penetrate into the womb of impervious nature herself. Man will penetrate into the womb of impervious nature herself. This phrase would have shocked romantics like Shelley to the bone. But Brooks glorifies it, showing us a great leap forward for humankind. The two voices of these texts clearly communicate very different ideas about the value of the frontier. Shelley says to the reader, and by extension all of you, that the means of the frontier do not justify the end as best highlighted when Walton makes his decision to turn back from his expedition to the Arctic, which would have brought knowledge, but also death and destruction. Brooks says to the viewer, and by extension all of you, that the suffering the frontier causes is justified by what it achieves, as its pain is eclipsed by its progress. Shelley says to the audience that a responsible creator and or father will realise that the pursuit of knowledge is not always the best thing for the creature, and they'll be born into a world of hate and be alone among humans. Brooks says to the audience that a responsible creator will realise that the pursuit of knowledge is the best thing for the creature, as we'll be born into a world of understanding and we'll have a father to guide him. But wait, I hear you asking, you haven't talked about the difference between the world the monster is born into. Dude, man, good question, honestly. Well, I'm glad you asked. The differences of adaptations requires a deeper discussion. As for the flag in my introduction, the authors are born into different worlds with different values, so we must examine the worlds themselves. It's clear that Shelley and Brooks have different ideas on what the pursuit of the frontier means, but they both agree on the role of the society. That is, the world the monster is born into will drastically alter its characterisation. To understand the difference between the worlds, it is first essential to understand the difference between the monsters. 
Most of you in the audience may think that the original creature is like Brooks's huge, muscular, ugly, bumbling idiot. But in the original novel, the monster is incredibly eloquent and sophisticated, even having read Paradise Lost, although he's still huge, muscular, and ugly. Brooks and Shelley have very different views on how people would respond to an eloquent but disfigured creature, but both emphasise the collective responsibility for the creature. The monster remarks the human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union. Note the description of senses. Shelley is making it clear that the sheer ugliness of the monster prevents him from accepting society, which is reinforced by a blind man being the only character to ever truly see the monster. This visual focus by Shelley not only relates to the symbolism of the eye, but makes subtle allusions to the romantic ideals of humanity as part of nature. The view that humans, created by God, are beautiful, and that the monster, created by science, a false god, is ugly, suggests that the natural is virtuous and the unnatural is unacceptable. Furthermore, the collective responsibility is evident in the quotation, if I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear, showing how the collective's inhumanity and evil towards the monster are a key part of its suffering and then the monster's evil itself. This demonstrates clearly that Shelley's sensibilities lie with the collective believing the monster is an irredeemable abomination, but the collective also being responsible for the monster's fate. The mute and stupid monster of Brooks's world faces a world of fearful hatred, a world in which the monster, although ugly, is beautiful to its father. His inability to be understood by people means that he is hated and never communicates with another person until the end of the film. Because of this persecution, Frederick undergoes a procedure which transfers parts of his intelligence to the monster. This creature, with his newfound ability to speak, says, he, Frederick, gave me a calmer brain and considerably more sophisticated way to express myself. The monster then explains his suffering to the antagonistic mob. The mob, in a very comedic way, apologises to the monster for the misunderstanding upon realising that his heart is more human than monster after all. The mob even extends their hand to the monster in friendship. And the leader of the mob, a comedically German figure, invites the monster back to his house for schnapps und strudel. In a typical Brooksian way, meaning is layered beneath the joke. The stereotypical German of schnapps und strudel and the stereotypical Germanness of schnapps und strudel is, is key as the collective inviting the monster back for schnapps und strudel shows how the monster is fully accepted into the German society. The monster also has a desire to inspire love. In Brooks's adaptation, this desire is realised as the understanding collective accepts the monster. This demonstrates clearly that Brooks's sensibility lie with the collective believing the monster is a redeemable creation and the collective is also responsible for its fate. Shelley believes that the primal fear that humans possess of what they don't understand means that the monster, no matter how eloquent, can never fit into society, which makes a very topical commentary on today's issues, showing how her voice is still relevant in the 21st century. While Brooks believes that a human reason and understanding means that a monster, no matter how foul, could join the society if it can fulfil the social construct. Both authors demonstrate how they believe that the responsibility of the creator isn't the only important factor in the monster's downfall or liberation. Well, after all this, we come back to the initial question. To what extent do appropriated texts enrich our understanding of classic literature by providing a new voice for a new audience? Well, by juxtaposing the values of the two composers and presenting it to the audience, it makes it far easier to extract meaning from the texts, as we've just discovered with the frontier and the collective. And thus, it greatly enriches our understanding from the text. But this isn't the only thing I want you to take away from this talk. If you remember, earlier in our analysis, I said that Shelley would have been chilled to the bone upon hearing about Brooks's glorification for the taming of nature. But the truth is, what Shelley would feel about Brooks's adaptation doesn't matter. I mean, the illustrations I've been showing are adaptations in the own right, and I doubt Shelley would have approved of those either. At the end of the day, Brooks's adaptation of Frankenstein itself doesn't really matter, and Shelley telling the story she crafted doesn't really matter either. The point is, once the words leave the page or the jokes leave the screen, it's no longer Shelley and Brooks's adaptation of Frankenstein. It's yours. And I don't mean just with Frankenstein. Every book, movie, TV show, song you've ever experienced comes a new adaptation. And juxtaposing your values with the values of the text you have adapted enriches both your understanding and the understanding of the text. So, before I go, I have one final question to ask. We've heard what Frankenstein sounds like when being spoken by Shelley and Brooks, but what does Frankenstein sound like when being spoken by you? <laughs>